fire for them, fire for them. If you're looking for that 35 bag umbrella and all damn thing there, keep it locked with this Unomics podcast. podcast, podcast, podcast. Yo, what's going on, beautiful people? You're not into another episode of the Dish Notes podcast. This is episode 331. We are talking the election. On Thursday, the 4th of July, millions of people across the country casted their vote to see who will be their local MP and, of course, who's going to be the ruling party and prime minister of the country for the next four to five years. So this week's episode, we're going to focus on the results, who won, where, and then we're going to do some analysis. What did we see in terms of the numbers? How many people came to vote? What was the difference? Did Gaza have an impact? What was people's motivations for voting? Did it follow the polls? And we're going to do some analysis on how really fair is our current electoral system? Because it's a bit of a madness and that's been quite a hot topic. But yeah, man, we're going to get into that after this short break. But yeah, amazingly, Labour with a landslide victory. Keir Starmer is the new Prime Minister. The country has revolted against the Tories. All the details coming up after this short break. So there we have it. Finally, the Tories are out of here after 14 years of austerity and scandal after scandal, especially the last five years. We've had three prime ministers, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. Scandal after scandal, mishap after mishap. They put the country in the complete gutter. Now they're out of here. Hallelujah. Labour won this election with a historic, historic majority. So there's 650 seats in Parliament. So there's 650 MPs. To win, you need to have a majority of the MPs, right? You need to have more MPs. You need to have enough MPs that if you all vote in your favour, you can pass whatever law you want to, yeah? That's how you form a government. You have a majority, right? In 2010, I believe... And in 2017, there were coalition governments when David Cameron won a minority, Theresa May won a minority, but they didn't have enough seats to form a government and be able to push through the law, so they had to do bad bitch link-ups. So in 2010, it was David Cameron and Nick Clegg with the Liberal Democrats. In 2017, it's Theresa May and the DUP, uh, Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland, right? But this time... Star and them don't need no help. They had a historic majority of 174 seats. So let's go through the results. Labour won 412 seats. That is 211 more seats than the last election in 2019. Conservatives won 121 seats. They lost a whopping 251 seats. Liberal Democrats got a record number of 72 seats. That's up by 64 from the last election. SNP, they got nine seats. They got basically obliterated in, in Scotland by Labour. They lost 39 seats. Sinn Féin and, Sinn Féin and Northern Ireland got seven seats. Reform, brand new party, Nigel Farage and his, and his racist boys, they got five seats. Um, Green Party, they got um, career best, um, four seats, that's up three. And then you got played Krimru in, um, Kimru in Wales, they got two extra seats, they got four now. And Democratic Unionist Party, they got five seats in Northern Ireland, they've lost three. And we got six independents, including the great Jeremy Corbyn. Now, Labour have got majority 174 seats. This is the highest majority since the Second World War. This is the worst ever performance in terms of seats from the Conservative Party. This is their lowest amount of seats in history since like the mid-1800s. And of course, it's the highest Liberal Democrat tally since 1923. So this was a very historic election for a variety of reasons. And we're going to get into analysis right now. So this is what I want to drive home. Vote share, right? What is vote share? The percentage of the votes casted, what amount of the, what proportion of these votes went to the party in question, right? So you talk, let's talk of the popular vote. That means how many people voted, right? So if a million people voted and 500,000 vote for Labour, that means Labour got 50% of the popular vote. That means they got a voter share of 50%. What's interesting is in this election, the vote share and the seat share saw quite drastic, if not historic, disparities. So Labour got 33.7% of the vote for the top of my head, right? They got like 9.5 million votes, yeah? They got 34% of the vote. So one in three people voted for Labour. So the majority of people didn't vote for Labour, right? They got 64% of the seats. They've got, their, vote, their seat share is almost double their vote share. 
So they were able to squeeze through in all these constituencies to dominate parliament. Conservatives, they got 24% of their vote of the votes, but they got 19% of the seats. So they got less seats than their vote share. Reform got 14%. So they got the third highest share of votes, right? I think 4 million people voted for the Reform Party. But they only got 1% of the seats. That's not democratic, in my opinion. Liberal Democrats, they got 12% of the votes. They got 11% of the seats. So that mirrors pretty good. Green Party, they got 7% of the vote, but 1% of the seats. That's wild. Completely and utterly wild. Labour, in terms of the number of votes they've got, they increased the number of votes by vote share by 2%. So they got 2% more of the total amount of votes from last election to this election. So when Jeremy Corbyn in 2019 went against um, Boris Johnson, they got 2% more in terms of the total, um, in terms of vote share than last time. But they got 200 more seats. How can you get 2% more of the voting pie, but you end up with 200 more seats? That's insane. The Tory vote share plummeted. They got 20% less, they got 20 points lower vote share and they got, which ended up at um, 24%. When Boris Johnson ran for um, government in 2019, he got 44% of the votes. Reform, as I said, they got 14% of the votes, 4, millions, 4 million votes, but they couldn't convert it to seats. I think they came second in like 98 constituencies. 182 seats went from Tory seats to Labour seats. That is a absolute shit show of the highest regard. Now let's talk about voter turnout, right? So you might hear voter turnout, voter turnout. It's quite simple. How many, how, what percentage of eligible people on the electorate came out to vote, right? 60% of the voters eligible for voting turn out to vote. That includes postal, right? This is the second lowest since 1885. The only time this was lower was in October 2001, and that's October 2001. If we compare it to the last elections that we've seen, and these are the uh, the Jeremy Corbyn versus the Tory one, so 2017, Corbyn versus Theresa May, 2019, Corbyn versus Boris Johnson. Last election, 67.3% people came out to vote. 2017, 68.8% of people came out to vote. This was down to 60%. People stayed at home. In Wales, the voter turnout was 56%, Northern Ireland, 57%, Scotland, 59%, England, 60%. But obviously, England is the biggest country, so they have the biggest share of the votes. Manchester, Rosholm was a constituency in the election of the lowest voter turnout, a voter turnout of 40%. So six out of 10 people in Manchester, Rosholm area did not vote. Wild. This is Labour's biggest ever majority. Um, and this was since 1997 when, um, sorry, this is the second biggest ever majority. Uh, sorry, this is the second biggest majority for since Tony Blair, who had seven, uh, 178 in 1997, followed by 166 in 2001. Like he, he slapped the elections. This is the second biggest majority post war. Sorry, people. Now, if we look at vote share, and I'm going to put a graph either here or there, depending on what spaces and edits are on YouTube. You can see by the graph that Labour's vote share didn't exactly go up. It kind of stayed the same or, or dipped. It was the Conservatives' vote share that just tanked everywhere, right? So Labour's vote share in the West Midlands and, south, and the southwest of England kind of stayed stagnant. But in London, their vote share actually went down. And we're going to talk about that a bit later. Third parties absorbed the Conservative plummet as well as Labour. And, um, and Labour, of course, Conservatives plummeted virtually everywhere. The only place where Labour's votes like really rose was in Scotland, and that's where the SNP completely and utterly eviscerated themselves. There was 15 seats where if the talk, if reform didn't exist, assuming the majority of the votes, if not all those votes go to Conservatives, the Conservatives would have won those seats. But even still, it should have been a whopping majority for Labour. In my opinion, we're going to see from the data, the Liberal Democrats took the more centre-right, reasonable Tory vote. And then obviously that like, the more hard-right Tory vote, that's where reform came and, and, and yacked them. So in, in the south of England, this is where the Lib Dems were, were cooking, yeah? So in areas like Wimbledon, South Devon, Chesham, Epson, Epson and Elwell, Chelmsford, 
this is where Liberal Democrats were able to take seats from the Tories. They, out of their 72 seats, 60 of them, they snatched from the Tories, right? If you take a, if you take an area like Turnbridge and Turnbridge Wells, this has been a strong majority, like of like plus 25 percent for the Conservatives since 2010. Now the Lib Dems have a strong majority. So this is an area where the Conservatives had a lockdown. Big, big gaps in the elections when they win. Now the, now the Liberal Democrats won with a big gap. We're seeing a historic fall off from the Conservatives. There were certain Tory seats where they had 70 to 77% of the vote share ending up at 38%, 35%. It was a catastrophic election for the Tories. The Greens, they did their thing. They said, listen, we've got four targets. Brighton Pavilion, Bristol Central, Wavy Valley and North Her um, Herefordshire. They won all four. So big up Carla Dana and Adrian Ramsdale. Big up their thing. Now let's talk about the black vote. And also the, the um, Muslim slash Asian vote. It's very interesting because we saw a lot of talk about how the ethnic minorities are, might start turning their back on Labour. Now, historically, for those who don't know, ethnic minorities tend to vote for Labour at 8 out of 10 clip, right? At 80%. Like, I believe Asians is like in the low 80s, like 82%. Black African Caribbeans is like 88% from the last time when I was doing this research in the 2019 election, right? And then also, when you, when you think about these populations tend to be in London, for example, London, pe more people tend to vote for Labour, so on and so forth. Now, what's happened since the last election? Jeremy Corbyn, who managed to mobilise a lot of ethnic minorities, we saw record numbers of people joining up for the Labour Party. Right? On the Jeremy Corbyn. So you got that. You got the Ford report, which showed, we highlighted a hierarchy of racism when anti-black racism and Islamophobia was not taken seriously by the Labour Party whatsoever. We saw how Keir Starmer said it was okay to turn off gas and electric, I mean, electricity, cut off water, cut off food supplies. They were not trying to, they will keep stressing Israel's right to defend themselves as we were watching Israel kill 200 to 100 people, 100 to 200 people a day. They refused to back a ceasefire until America changed their minds. So that really, imp all these things impacted the Asian community, the Muslim community, the black community, right? So how was this going to impact? And then of course you get towards election, approaching election time, Diane Abbott, who, in my opinion, accurately depicted in the letter that you can't really compare anti-black racism to what the Irish and, the, and Jewish communities face is because they're not as easily identifiable. Whereas you can identify a black person rather easy. For example, there's been times when I've been in certain areas in Essex, like Grace, Tilbury, when I'm walking with one of my boys and people have drove off, drove past me, shouting the N-word and throwing an egg at us. You won't be able to tell if somebody's Irish as easily or Jewish as easy, unless they're dressed as an Orthodox Jew. Do you right? So obviously she apologised for this. She said she, missed, she should have framed it better. And she was effectively suspended for the Labour Party. They removed the whip from her. This flipping investigation went on for months, only to find out that it got concluded in December. And under pressure, they restored the whip back to Diane Abbott. Not on top, not only that, we had a Tory donor who donated 10 million say publicly he hates Diane Abbott, I'm paraphrasing, and she deserves to be shot. They then debated this racist attack on Diane Abbott in Parliament. She stood up over 40 times. They wouldn't even let the woman speak on her own issue. Insane. And all the Labour Party did was use it as a marketing tool. So I was like, hmm, what's going to happen here in terms of the vote? So now polling from YouGov showed that the intent, vote intention is looking at in the 70s for the black vote and in the 40s for the Muslim vote. And that's quite disappointing when I saw that because I was like, guys, come on, fam. It's not everyday labour. And I've been saying that you lot know me. I've been saying this for time. People on Twitter called me coon, shiny suits. I uh, got a little job in the city now. Bro, man has never voted. Man, I probably would no, not probably. I would never vote for Conservatives. One for economic reasons. I don't believe in austerity. That's why I never voted for them before. And also, I know what how they are when it comes to they pedal hate, racism, and bigotry and xenophobia to get an election. And I don't stand for that. Do you know what I'm saying? 
in the elections I've been at, I voted in 2010, I voted for Labour. 2015, I think I voted for Labour. 2017, 2019, and 2024, I voted for Lib Dems. I, I'm, I'm not on that side of politics. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I don't believe in any parties there for the black people. That's stupid. There's no evidence of that ever. No evidence. There may be some candidates that are 10 toes down, like your Diane Abbott, your Ian McDonald's, or your Jeremy Corbyn's, for the most part, they don't give a, they don't give a shit. Immigration Act that came through that effectively led to the Windrush scandal. The majority, only like the people I mentioned, Diane Abbott, Ian McDonald, um, Jeremy Corbyn, and like maybe like four other Labour MPs, they were the only ones who voted against it. The rest of them abstained, including David Lammy and them man. Keith Starmer and them man. Yeah? So this thing like, oh, they care about the black people, all stupid. Then eventually, now nah, people know. Right? Cool. Anyway, let me get back to it. So the black folks. So what I tried to do to do my own research was like, let me find out what constituencies have a high proportion of black population. So I looked at the areas with the highest proportion of black population. We tend to be heavily concentrated in London and one area in Birmingham. So the areas are Peckham, Vauxhall and Campbell are green, and these are constituencies. Area from Thamesmead, Deptford, no, not, not, sorry, not Deptford, Scratch Deptford, Edmonton and Winchmore Hill, Croydon North, Clapham and Brixton Hill, Croydon West, Tottenham and Bermondsey, Bermondsey and Old Suffolk, and Birmingham Ladywood, yeah? So these are areas that the black vote has a higher level of significance. I wanted to see how, it, how, these type of issues impacted the black vote, right? And the total vote. So in all these areas, they were actually previously Labour areas. Shock horror, right? So I wanted to see, did Labour still win? And if they did, how much did they gain or lose seats? Let's go through it. So Peckham hold with Maitaya Fambule, but their vote to share was down by 12%. Vauxhall Campbell Green, Labour hold, um, the MP, Florence Eshalomi, voter share down by 3.1%. So that's a marginal vote share. Erif and Thamesmead. And I know this area is like mainly African. Labour held Abena Opong Asare, Ghanaian woman, votes down 3.3%. Interestingly, reform came second, but by a distant second though, right? Edmonton and Winchmore Hill. Another area, Labour holds Kate Osamore, votes down 8.2%, black woman MP. Croydon North, right? And this area has got, is, a, is probably one of the first areas that have quite even mix of African and Caribbeans. Uh, Labour hold by Steve Reid, voter share down 5.8%. Clapham and Brixton Hill, Labour hold, Bell Ribio Addy, actually up by 1.1%. The only place I went where went, the Labour vote went up. Croydon West, Labour held by Sarah Jones, down by 12.6%. Tottenham, Labour hold, David Lammy, this is constituency. This was the biggest one, down by 20.3%. Now, I think Gaza had a big thing to do with this one as well. Birmingham and Old Suffolk, Neil Cole, Labour held, down by 4.6%. Birmingham Ladywood, this, this has a large African population, but as well a large Muslim population, right? So the, the MP for this area was Shabana Mahmoud, and she just about held off from Ahmed Yacoub, an independent, and her vote share went down by 40.5%. Massive. So you saw where the black vote and uh, the Muslim Asian vote really impacted, right? So what could we see here? Definitely impact on the black vote, but not significant. And in the areas I believe were significant, I believe was more likely due to the Gaza stuff. We can keep going about this. West Streeton and Jess Phillips. These are two high profile MPs, they're, they're also in Keir Starmer's cabinet, which I'll speak on later. West Streeton, who's the health secretary, he won by 528 seats. Baslin Lian uh, Mohammed, as an independent, independence was 529 seats away from winning. Jess Phillips won by 693 seats. Jody McIntyre for the Workers' Party of Britain, second place. And these people complained about nasty election. No, the people aren't happy with genocide supporters. And unfortunately for you lot, uh, Jess Phillips is, um, I believe she is Birmingham and Yedley. West Streeton is Ilford North, I believe. A big Muslim population in these areas. A lot of ethnic minorities. They're not messing with that type of stuff. 
Do you get what I'm saying? Let's talk about some big name losers. Yeah? Liz Trust, former Prime Minister, booted out in 38 days. Out of here. Theresa Coffey, out of here. Penny Mordaunt, uh, who many believe was going to be the next Conservative leader, out of here. Jacob Rees Moggs, former Brexit minister, out of here. Grant Chaps, former transport minister, and you think you might have done that in the education secretary, out of here. See you bum ass youths later. I want to talk about quickly, yeah, another L for Labour. This was self inflicted. So it was very clear those from like the left, those who are pro Palestine, were getting purged from the Labour Party, right? This day, one for more centrist, in my opinion, centre right, yeah, Labour friends of Israel type situation. So at the eve, like, so right at the deadline, Fazia Shaheen, who just recently had a child, who was tipped to be a, a potential future Labour leader, was removed as a Labour candidate for, I believe it was Chingford. Yeah, Chingford and Woodford Green, right? Like right at the end where she couldn't really appeal or do anything about it, right? And this is the area she actually grew up in. She knows the ends. Do you know what I'm saying? So obviously she was very disappointed. She ran as independent. Ian Duncan Smith, he was a current incumbent for the Conservative Party and he held his seat by 4.5k votes. So you're probably thinking, what's the issue? Well, the issue is, Ian Duncan Smith lost his vote share, went down by 12.6%. But Labour's candidate, um, Sharma Tatla, she split the vote with Fazia Shaheen. Fazia Shaheen got 12.4 thousand votes. Um, Sharma Tatla got 12.5 thousand votes. If you combine those two votes, shares, that's, 20, that's 25 thousand. They blow my man out of the water. That's another seat. They would have walked it. Very, very silly. Now, let's get back on to um, the impact of Labour's policies on the election in terms of their seats. There are 21 seats here where the population in those areas were at least 30% Muslim. Labour vote share dropped 29% on average in those areas. Yeah? From 65% in 2019 to 36% in 2024. So you've seen 29% voter share. Remember in the other in the in the areas where there was a strong black community, it was in the 8%, 4%, a cheeky 12% here. The biggest one was a 20%, uh 20 20% for David Lammy. But in the areas where it's mainly when there's like one in three people are Muslim or more the vote share is dropping by 29%. Turnout also fell in these areas by 11.2%. Labour still remained the largest party in 17.21% of these seats, but they also lost to, income, to independents, like Jeremy Corbyn, who they tried to say it was a close race and he smacked it. Congratulations, congratulations. I don't know why Labour did that. Stupid, they tried to get Corbyn out of here. You're not getting Corbyn out of here. He's too patterned. He's been the MP for that place since like, what, 1982? The longer than I've been alive, the people know him, and also his reputation precedes himself. So now let's look at cabinet. So obviously we've got the new prime minister Keir Starmer, and I'm going to talk about his policies and details as the weeks go on. The new deputy prime minister is Angela Rayner. The new chancellor is Rachel Reeves, who's already hinting that we got no money, so we're looking at austerity. Remember I told you that. Home secretary is Yvette Cooper. Foreign secretary David Lammy. Health Secretary Wes Sweeten, who won by 500 votes. Education's Bridget Philipson. Energy Secretary Ed Miliband, um, former Labour leader who lost to David Cameron in 2010. Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds. Defence Secretary John Healy. And Chief Whip Sir Alan Campbell. Now, I'm going to end this pod with a rant about how broken the system is. Right? I've always been a believer of proportional representation system. And what is this? However many votes you get, that's how many seats you get. You get 50% of votes, you get 50% of the seats. You get 10% of the votes, you get 10% of the seats. Simple as. Now, we have a first-past-the-post system, and that means whoever has the most votes in constituency wins the seat. Even if that means you have 10% of the votes and everybody else had 9%, 8%, 5%, 6%, which virtually means 90% of the people didn't vote for you, you still win that seat. Now, what this does do means that the chances of having a hung parliament where there's no majority is a lot less likely. When, if you have a proportional representational system, hung parliament is more likely. I don't mind though. I think everybody should be forced to work with each other for the betterment of the people. If it's up to me, we won't be voting for MPs, we'll be voting for policies. 
Because Keir Starmer with, with a majority of 174, he could put through whatever the heck he wants. Labour could legit, if they wanted to, put, put through policies that have no benefit to the British people, but because they have a majority of 174 and the chief whip, which is in this case, will be the job of Sir Alan Campbell, tells them this is a free whip, which means if you vote against us, you lose your job. You, you're not part of the Labour Party anymore. You're still MP, but you're not part of the Labour Party. People are going to vote. They could push whatever they want. That's not democratic in my opinion. Labour having 33% of the vote for 64% of the seats is insanity to me. As much as I despise them, if a reform party get 14% of the vote, they shouldn't get 1% of the seats. For example, reform party got 4 million votes. The Lib Dems got 3 point something million votes. Reform get 5 seats, Lib Dems get 72. How can we have more votes than you and you've got like more than 10 times our seats? That doesn't make sense. And let's compare this, right? Labour has the second biggest majority post-war. But when and I, I looked through the data and Statista.com had data up until 1918. So it says the end of the First World War. So this is over 100 years of data. Labour has the lowest voter share for a winning party in over 100 years. But they have one of the biggest majorities in history. How? In the last election, Boris Johnson had got 365 seats. He had a majority of 81. That was a great, a massive election win, right? Boris Johnson got 43.6. He got 10% more votes, 10%, 10 points more than Keir Starmer. Boris Johnson got 13.96 million votes. Almost 14 million votes. Keir Starmer got, he almost got 4 million more votes than Keir Starmer and had like, what, 45 less seats? Jeremy Corbyn, in the last election, had a voter share of 2% less than Keir Starmer this election. He got 202 seats, less than half the seats Keir Starmer got. Keir Starmer, I mean, Corbyn got 10.269 million votes. That's a million, no, that's like 700,000 more votes than Keir Starmer this election. And got nowhere near in our seats. If you take Theresa May in 2017, she even lost seats. She got 317 seats down from 330 seats. This was when Jeremy Corbyn picked up an extra 30 million, 30 seats. Theresa May got 13.6 million votes. That's 4 million more than Keir Starmer. This system doesn't make sense. Corbyn in 2017, he got 40% vote share. He got 7% more vote share than, than the Labour Party this year. He got 12.87 million votes. Three and a half million more than Keir Starmer. Only got 232 seats compared to Keir Starmer's 411. This was seen as a disaster. This doesn't make sense, guys. This doesn't make sense. This is, this is nonsense. And remember, this, in this election, this was the second lowest voter turnout. So the second lowest amount of people came to vote. And you got the lowest vote share for William Party in the second lowest election. I've seen stats flying everywhere. They're saying that ba ba virtually 80% of the electorate didn't vote for this, cons this government and they're going to be the majority. And when you look at all the YouGov polls before the election and I saw a poll after the election, the, major the biggest reason by far for people voting for Keir Starmer and the Labour Party was to get rid of the Tories. My prediction is they're going to lose the next election. Because one, they don't really have any policies and no uh, austerity is coming. Two, you only got nine... 0.5 million votes and a lot of your votes were off the strength of we want the Tories gone their days are numbered and we need to change the electoral system so that's it for this week's pod I'm going to be back with another joint probably like on Young on Thursday but yeah man crazy election we see what happens next but yeah proportional representation system is needed because this is a joke this is a joke but yeah on to the next episode Peace. Bow.